Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast, helping engineers, producers, and artists create professional recordings and mixes, even from home. I'm your host, Mike and Davina. Let's get started. Hey, welcome to the Master Mix Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. My name is Mike Navina, and today we've got an awesome interview. This interview is with Mike Exeter, who if you're not familiar with Mike, Mike is an amazing engineer and producer who has worked with a ton of really big bands such as Black Sabbath, Judas Priest, Cradle of Filth, and so many more. And in our conversation here today, Mike shares a story about how he really made himself very diverse with his skills. And as you'll hear in his story, All of these little things that he was learning really came together in a big way so that his career could skyrocket and that he could work with amazing bands and it's prepared him for the opportunities that have come his way. So I just think it's a really great conversation all about finding your niche in the audio industry and the importance of diversifying your skills so that when opportunity comes your way, you are ready for it and you can go all in and get amazing results. So I think it's a really great conversation, and I'm really excited for you to hear it. So let's not waste any time. Let's just jump right into it. Mike Exeter, thank you so much for being on the Master Mix podcast. How are you doing, man? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. No problem. It's uh, something I've been looking forward to. Amazing, amazing. For people who might not know your background, can you give us a little bit of that story in terms of how you got into music, who you are, what you do, and... All that good stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, what I what I do is I, I produce um, and engineer and mix um, records. I I'm trying to li- get away from the idea that I just do metal because I don't even think I do metal. Um, but I've worked. Uh, some of my biggest clients are Black Sabbath and Judas Priest, um, and and I have dabbled into um, the black satanic metal of Cradle of Filth as well back in my dim and distant past. Um, but I like, I, I work on anything that's really got a great story to tell. Um, I love working with singers and, um, that's, you know, pretty standard across most genres. Um, I started, um, over 30 years ago, uh, I'm a keyboard player or I was a keyboard player. I don't practice enough to even call myself one anymore. And because of, um, sort of being around in the late seventies, early eighties, um, Keyboards were very heavy. Um, You know, there weren't many um, portable keyboards around, so I wasn't in bands. And I thought, there's got to be a way I can be involved in music somehow. And I just did the usual Red Album covers and saw these mystical people called engineers and producers and thought, I wonder what they do. And eventually I found out, and um, and it just took me down a route that ended up with me being here, um, you know, 30-odd years later. That's amazing. I think you're actually one of the only people that that has mentioned that they haven't been in a band before. So it's 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 interesting. Like I'm curious to know when you when you finally got into producing and working with bands, did you feel like that changed the way you interacted with them, or I guess maybe you didn't know any different, right? No, I mean I just um, I I've been around musicians and I'd I'd watch from the sidelines and um, I uh, you know I studied piano and uh, I was part of um, choral stuff going on at school um, but I just I just never got to play in bands because I could I couldn't recreate the sounds my favorite band growing up was Pink Floyd and I was like why does why does my piano not sound like wish you were here <laughs> you know and it's because I didn't have a Hammond you know it was simple shit like that that now I know um, but yeah I just think it's it's mostly a personality led thing anyway this business so as long as you can get on with people. I figure my grounding was um, was playing rugby with people, you know, sports, and and I really I I didn't enjoy that that much. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, it's it's cool. I come from a sporting family, so um, I was the uh, the black sheep. That that's cool. Well, I mean, it's it's interesting, and I think um, there's a little bit to unpack there. Like you know, you had mentioned that you would listen to those Pink Floyd records and like not know how they got those sounds, and I think you know. It, I mean, we're all, I, I think anyone in this industry is a bit of a tone chaser to some degree. You know, we're, we're all trying to, we hear something on a record and we're like, how do they do that? Like, I want to be able to do that in a record that I'm working yeah. on and that kind of thing, right? So what was that process like for you when you first got into, actually, maybe we should backtrack. How did you get into the recording then? Like, you were obviously listening to these records and you, you were inspired by the people that were working on them. How, how did you get into actually working on them, on records and producing? Um... 
I I figured because I was pretty good on computers. This is, this is like seventies. I, I was born in sixty seven, so my my early earliest album recollection was Dark Side of the Moon. Um, my dad played it to me, um, and uh, my first album that he bought me was Journey to the Center of the Earth by Rick Wakeman. So he he was like, if you're learning piano, you should check this guy out. He's he, his words were he's fairly useful. And the album cover was Rick surrounded by keyboards at the festival hall wearing a gold cape. Um, so I kind of, um, I, I started, started working my way through all these fantastic albums. Um, and I just love the Sonic, um, just, just where they took me. You know, these were the days where you opened up an album and you sat there for 20 minutes listening to it and then you read the, everything on the sleeves. So I ended up um, really having a hankering to to do more with keyboards um, because that was my thing. But I was also fairly geeky with computers. And again, this is early days. So we, we were talking about time-sharing terminals in a school computer lab in 1977, you know, this kind of stuff. Um, and I loved the fact that it appeared that there was some kind of connection between computers and music, you know, even even just that the early days of the Apple II, people were doing things that were quite interesting. And then amazingly, things like the Fairlight came out and there was this, you know, here's this thing that can capture real sounds. So I I put two and two together and came up with this grand plan that I was going to be, um, I was going to be really important to a very, very rich musician or producer. And I would, I'd, so I, I ended up, going to full sale in Florida because they were the training center for New England Digital who made this device called the Synclavier, which was really rich man's territory. These things were like $300,000 and they were the forerunner to everything we do today. They were digital audio workstations. Um, and so I figured, well, if I go and learn about this, that will put me in a good place. I'm quite uh, in sort of in a similar thing. Andrew Sheps actually did that job for people. He was Stevie Wonder and Michael Jackson, Sinclair operator. So there was a job there, but he had it. Over here, Trevor Horn, massive producer, he, he had his guys. But what that did was that, that got me um, interested enough to go and pursue this. I'd also seen a fantastic um, magazine article in this very, very old defunct um, publication called Recording Engineer and Producer. Um, and I remember seeing the front cover and there was a picture of Hugh Padgham and Howard Jones. And I knew that they'd worked on a production with Phil Collins of one of Howard Jones's songs. So I grabbed this because I really liked the song. And inside it was the Bible. This was how they made a record. And I devoured this thing um, for weeks and weeks. And I can remember seeing the adverts and the, and the technical um, reviews and stuff of things like Sony PCMF1s and, and mastering stuff and all, all, this, all this stuff that was going on probably mid-80s, 85, 86. And I was working, I'd, I started working with my dad on computer controlled machines and robots and stuff like that. So I had this technical thing going on, but I still had this hankering to go into music. So long story, not that short, I end up in Florida and I'm at full sail, hopefully learning how to be the synclavist. And during that summer, New England Digital went bust. And yeah, I did buy Betamax when I was younger as well. So I am that guy that, that puts the bet on the wrong horse. But as a result, I mean, even within like the first month of being at Full Sail, I, I thought, actually, there's more to this than just being around computers. In fact, there's a whole lot, way, way better things than being around computers. And I still feel that today. They're, they're great, but it's all about interaction. It's a people thing. So I ended up just loving being around the studio. And what could have turned into being a Sinclair operator and someone that worked in audio picture because that sort of that looked like an easy gig i ended up just loving being in the studio around musicians and it gave me an opportunity to play as well i was suddenly able to go in and play keyboards on other people's material and that gave me my lectures and my labs 
that were part of my course. And then the rest of the time I was playing on other people's stuff. So I immersed myself in, you know, a year of being around music in studios and you couldn't get me away from it. And, uh, I just, you know, it was, it was the enthusiasm uh, that carried me through. And straight from there, I ended up um, interning at Full Sail, working for the, it's called Platinum Post at the time. That was the pro side of Full Sail. And we were working with um, Walt Disney um, and quite a few other corporate things. Um, so my first full days in the studio were working on um, the Mickey Mouse Club revival, Um which was, and with a fantastic producer, a guy called Mikey Jeezy, who'd just come off a run with Richard Marks, and he was a keyboard player, a brilliant, brilliant guy, programming the entire backing tracks. We'd put those onto 24 track, mix those down to two tracks, send the slave reel down to Disney. The Mouseketeers would sing on it, and then they'd come back and we'd sync them up and do a 48 track mix. And I was just second engineer then, but it was a real. Uh, real insight into how records were made, you know, on on a budget and a time scale. That's amazing. So it was, um, yeah, it was good. It was, it definitely wasn't rock and roll. It was um, incredibly corporate and fantastically intricate stuff. But it's interesting you know? that you jumped into that world because I do feel like a lot of people don't even think think of it as an option you know like we so many of us are just musicians that are like oh, i want to record my own band so i'm going to just work only with musicians and be in a studio making music but there is that whole corporate side of the industry as well which can be pretty lucrative and there's also the audio post-production side of it very lucrative field as well so you know it, it's cool that you had that experience kind of dabbling in a little bit of everything and you can see for yourself which areas you liked yeah i think you have to be open to it you have to i think anybody that um, how do I phrase this? I think I think the budgets are so stretched um, or crunched, maybe uh, nowadays that there's a very very small percentage of people that can make their living just recording bands or producing their own stuff. You've got to be incredibly lucky and have all the cards full right for you for that to become your main career, and that's all you do. Or you had to be doing it. 25 years ago and getting on some big albums and getting lots of royalties. So, um, so I know very, a, a lot of my colleagues and contemporaries all go into different areas as well as the main thing. In fact, sometimes the main thing isn't the big payer. It's the one that we do for, for love. And we do all these other things because it's on the sideline of that. And it enables us to still come back to our core interest or core love which is making records but it's it's in such a strange place the industry that you can either complain about it or you can find something else to do alongside it and most of us that are doing it on a daily basis just we go okay so i'm not doing that today i'm doing some voiceovers for something or you know i'm doing some mentoring or whatever so i think you've got to have an open mind Absolutely. very very definitely hundred percent. I, I totally agree with that. That's kind of, it's similar background to me. Like when I first got into it, I, I went to school for it as well. And then I got jobs in audio post-production and tour managing. And I just was doing everything possible to find kind of where my niche was and what I liked. And, and you know, eventually I, I landed where I was. Right. But, but um, yeah, I do think that it, there is a lot to learn in trying a lot of different things out in the industry and, and seeing what, what fits for you. And it's also interesting too, because, you know, you said you were you were just like the computer guy, loved doing it, and you wanted to be the the Sinclover. Is that is that how you say it? The... Yeah, the Sinclavist. Sinclavist. Sorry, I always get I got told off over here because we called them the Sinclavier because we think it's French. It is not. It was it was an American product, but yeah, Sinclavist was the person that operated the Sinclavier. It's just a fancy way of you saying know. it, you know. You... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sinclavier. Yeah, <laughs> but, it, but it's, it's definitely not French, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But it's interesting because you said you went into it just thinking like that was the thing you were going to do. And, and and even even that way of thinking, I think, is really interesting, too, because you found this kind of niche that you were like, cool, there's not many people doing this. Like, I can put myself in here. And then that that got you into some other stuff. Um, you 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 had said that it's pretty hard these days for people to just jump right into, you know, making music full time and, and producing bands. 
Uh, but you're one of the people that has actually managed to do that, you know. So so for people who are in that boat where they're thinking like, well, yeah, I got into this because I want to work with bands. Like what what did that trajectory look like for you to be able to tr- transition from working in all those different fields to, to actually being able to work on bands? And, and how would you say how would what would you recommend for people who are looking to do that for themselves? I think it's uh, it's about retaining an open minded approach. Um, even back then. I, my, my route from Platinum Post was to then move up to New York, to Rochester, to, um, to a studio that was owned by a guy whose three friends had gone to full sale with me. They had an opening for a MIDI specialist. So my, my keyboard and technical background was really useful because I was one of the few people that went into full sale knowing how um it's sorry, I just gotta get rid of this call. Um yeah, the, I, I went in knowing how to um how to synchronize tape machines and computers together. I knew how to work with the very, very new Mark of the Unicorn had only literally that year come out with a thing called a MIDI timepiece, which was one of the first two multi input and output um MIDI interfaces to work with a Mac. Um so I was able to put this MIDI room together. That got me the job in Rochester. So I was MIDI specialist. I had a room to myself. I took every keyboard and this really weird Akai 12-track cassette-based tape machine. I made the room a production room. I then linked that room um, over RS-422 to the other studio so that you could be upstairs playing keyboards and controlling the modules down in the MIDI room and then patch the audio back. So I just I started to create this this niche for myself. At the same time, a very good friend of mine, um, Jeff Reedmiller, who is um, he's actually up at Dolby now in San Francisco. He's one of the t- top bods there. He was the tech at this studio, and he and I and the others all started to refurb the studio and do interconnections. And a knee VR went in instead of an AMAC Mozart, and so all of these all of these things came together. And during that process. Um, there were still lots of sessions going on. Bands were doing the graveyard shifts because they couldn't afford day rates. So this is something I don't see much of now. And I was, I was down in London yesterday at a really nice studio, Rack. It's, it's been there for decades, um, probably half a century or something. And, um, and they were talking about this. We, we don't seem to get the, you got an, um, a 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. session followed by a 7 p.m. till 7 a.m. session. But back in those days, this is like 91, 92, we definitely had overnight sessions. So I was able to go, well, I'm young. I can I can stay up for 20 hours. I'll assist the chief engineer during the day, and then I'll take on the night sessions. And just something about the other guys, they didn't want to do that. So I got my first production on this country record, which I did. I didn't know country. I we uh, my my ex at the time um she and i went to a, a bar to see them and wonder what the hell this line dancing thing was because we'd never seen it before being english but i did this country record and then i started getting surf punk and the local crooners who all wanted to be frank sinatra coming from new york obviously um so there was a lot of that going on and i um i just i took every session i could and it was just such a great grounding you know, we're back at back in. I was there ninety two to ninety three, and um, we were very much working on tape um, and synchronizing keyboards via MIDI, and working on some of the weirdest Atari ST programs that were around. And I was a Mac guy, I still am. Um, but I was using Performer at the time, and so all this is going on, and I'm the guy linking it together. So uh, even then. I was getting into doing the bands, but I was still the guy that uh, saw the the Mac system with Sound Designer on it, Sound Toys, uh, not Sound Toys, Sound Tools. And I was the one editing albums together because you'd have to load them in off DAT, which is an old digital audio tape format. You'd have to load them into the computer with our one gigabyte drive that cost $5,000, sequence an album, spit it back out to a new DAT, so the transfer both ways was two hours. The editing was, you know, it was like, it was the only way you could stay digital and, and do album compilation. So I was learning all these skills, being paid to do it, 
Um, and burning the candle at both ends, probably. But as I say, I was young enough. It was fine. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you must have been one of the earliest adopters of digital recording that if you were into computers and all that stuff right away, like, yeah. it would make sense that you probably wanted to go the digital route more than you did the analog route, right? Well, analog was all we had to record on. It was like, um, I remember someone saying, can we do a sample rate convert? And someone laughed because it was like, if you wanted to do sample rate conversion on one song, it would probably take about 10 hours just because the number crunching wasn't there. These are, these are 40 megahertz Motorola processors back then. It's, just, it's ridiculous. You know, they, would, they were Mac, Mac SE, well, they weren't SE, they were um, Mac 2 FXs and things like that. These things were the cutting edge, but they, would, they did nothing compared to now. Um, but it was during that, that final couple of months I was there that I first got my hands on Pro Tools version one. And it was like, Ooh, this has got something about it. To totally took the, the linear Cubase page, the arrange page that only Cubase had done up to that point. Everybody else copied Cubase. They took that and suddenly audio was on different tracks and even the sync claviers didn't do that. Their audio sequencer was very much like you typed in time code and things like that. Whereas this was like, oh, this, there's something about this. It took a couple of years for them to get it sorted. But um, yeah, so I, 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 you know, again, you look at what Pro Tools has turned into now from, from its humble beginnings 25, 20, nearly 30 years ago. It's incredible, you know. So, um, I think I've just, uh, it, I, I know lots of people have gone through periods of time that are, are incredibly, um, uh, that you see, you know, paradigm shifts in technology, but I just feel I've gone through a few. Well, absolutely. Just hearing you talk about all of these different tools that you were using and, and the process for, for transferring things, you know, it, there was definitely a lot that goes into it. A lot, a lot that we take for granted these days because the tech, the tech is so easy to, to work with these days. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's very interesting. So, I love like hearing this progression of going through that that transition in technology, and then I, I agree with what you said about the graveyard shift thing. Like you don't see that anymore in studios, but it clearly was really important to you because you got that diversity in in the projects you were working on and allowed you to like connect with lots of different people. So, so at what point did you start to make that transition then from being like the graveyard shift kind of newbie guy to, to being like, okay, this is like, this is actually something I can do as a full-time gig and, and, you know, have, well, was, have a um, more manageable lifestyle, I guess, than doing graveyard yeah, shift full time. I, by the, by the end of my, my stint in, in America, cause, um, my visa allowed me to stay for the second year that I was there. It was all, all related to the schooling. Um, so I was, um, I was being kind of called into every session by the head engineer, Steve Forney. He was like, yeah, just, I want Mike, I want Mike on it. You know, we, we work really well together. And so I was constantly in sessions, um, and I transitioned more into assisting him in daytimes and some of the younger guys started to come through. By the time my visa was up, um, I'd done so many things. Um, with so many great people that I was like, okay, well, better get back to England because I don't want to screw with, you know, screwing up future visas. Um, and just started um, thinking, well, I can, I can write to studios and see if I can get a job, which didn't transpire to be great. Um, but what I did happen was I hit, I hit UB40's studio manager at exactly the right point when they were going off on tour for two years. And their front, front of house engineer was their producer. So he went. The other guy that worked at the studio didn't have, uh, he'd, he'd done a small uh, solo career. He'd had a, num a top 10 hit in the UK. He went. So suddenly they've got two, a 24 track and a 48 track studio with nobody to run it. I thought, oh, that'd be great. I can walk straight into a job. What I did was I freelanced there for a good year. And during that process, helped transition the the room which had the 24 track room which had an a Angela and it was a fucking brilliant sounding desk that had been gone to rack and ruin they'd had a flood so we refurbed that studio and made it into the cheap rock room and it was just brilliant 
it was sort of like like I'd been in Rochester. I suddenly had a new home, and eventually I was taken on, and uh, I became their head engineer for a few years. And during that point, it was like it's almost um, like osmosis. You you don't sort of get this defining moment. You're just living it, and you look back and go, oh. Well, maybe I am doing this for a living. <laughs> yeah, all Which your- is when the imposter syndrome starts, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a whole other topic we can go down a big rabbit hole with oh, for sure. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, still I, happens. Yeah. Well, I think, I think what you said about that whole osmosis thing is so true. It's like, you know, it, your experiences just had to all come together, right? And it, what's that saying? It's like, uh, luck is when opportunity and preparation strike or something like that, right? It's like... Absolutely. You know, that, yeah. that's very much sounds like what happened with you. Yeah, I think it's the same of... Um, I mean, I, I, I listen to uh, quite a few of the episodes of your podcast. I listen to everybody's and the, the guys who I really respect who keep coming up on all these podcasts, their stories are all so similar. And it's once you're presented with an opportunity you better be damn prepared to go for it. Because what's the worst that can happen? It doesn't work out. You don't get asked back the following day. But if you're not prepared and you think it's just going to land on your lap, it's not. There are plenty of people all fighting for the same job. And I tell you what, I think the biggest preparation, um, and Garth Richardson, who is a a superb guy, and I'm so pleased to to know him, um... He's he's absolutely spot on with the one of the biggest things about preparation is knowing your place in the room. It's knowing when to shut the fuck up. And you don't do it very often when you're starting out. You don't tend to put your put your uh, foot in it too often because you don't get asked back. That, that that's uh that's Garth's dad. Uh, I learned I learned from Garth's dad, Jack. Like he he was like my early mentor and then that was like I remember like day one, that was his lesson. He was just like, you just shut the fuck up, sit in the corner, watch and learn and we'll be good. <laughs> like, yeah. And so, yeah, because yeah. <laughs> because none of this is technical. I know we've just started, we've done 20 minutes on my technical upbringing, but I am literally the most untechnical guy in terms of what what you perceive in the studio. All that shit is like riding a bike. You put the effort in, you do your own, you, you, you practice. You wouldn't go to an audition for a band if you didn't know how to play the guitar. So that's a given that you're going to be good at that aspect of the job. So the rest of it is how to communicate with people. It's psychology. Absolutely right. That's, it's, that's an amazing point. Because I, I do think that we, so many people, especially when they're getting started, just think like, oh, this is just like a technical field. I just have to learn the tools, learn the software. If I, be, if I become a Pro Tools whiz, then like I can get any job. And it's like, well, there's a lot more to it. And people have to tolerate being in the room with you to, to yeah. walk you around. Well, I, I think that was interesting what Marcus Selly says. Um, I've heard him say a few times is if he's engineering for someone, he doesn't offer an opinion. That's humble. I attempt to be the same. I, I know a load of people listening to this will go, you hypocritical twat. But I do, I do. I, I'm very mindful of the, of the hierarchy in a session. Um, it just happens that when you have run that many sessions yourself and you don't have an engineer, you do your own engineering, the lines get a bit blurred. But generally it's i'm very mindful of walking into someone else's session and just making sure that i don't upset the apple cart because i've just had it too many times where people say something and you're like oh god i literally just spent two hours trying to negotiate this band down this route by lying to them about things because i know if they go down that route that's going to cause a problem between two members and I have to lie about something not working or a reason we can't do something in a certain way just to diffuse a situation. And you get someone walks in the room just trying to be helpful and they totally undermine you. And that's it. That, all that prep's fucked. And it's a real shame, you know, and, and it's, it's nothing personal ever, but you, yeah, you just have to, um, I think you just have to kind of suck it up. I wouldn't tell an airline pilot how to fly a plane. <laughs> It's true. 
<laughs> but it's it's so true. And I think that sometimes when you are just that quiet person in the room, or you, like like you said, like you know your role, and you let like the producer or whoever have their have control of the session. I think not only does that make the session run smoother because nobody's fighting for the to have their voice heard most, but also I think you learn a lot from being around those other people, and you kind of. You learn what works for you, what what doesn't work for you, and how you would approach sessions when you're in control. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot to learn from that. And and I'm curious to know, like, I know that you had the chance to work with Rick Rubin while working with Black Sabbath. And to me, like, that's a deadly combination. Like, Rick is obviously amazing and has been, like, you know, he's known for his massive iconic records. And, and Sabbath is obviously, like, incredible as well. Um, you know, I, I find that, like, I mean, Rick just has this, I feel like there's a mystique to Rick, you know, and like, and, and he just has this amazing ability to somehow the projects he works on, he just, he, he tends to work with a lot of bands that have had success in the past. And he has this amazing way of getting them to reconnect with that earlier sound, but with a modern twist. And so I was wondering if you could just share any big lessons that you learned as a result of being in the room with Rick. Yeah. Um, I, I find He's a problem solver. He's 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 more than that. He, he's he's two main things. He's a problem solver, in as much as a personality problem solver. He deals with relationships. I think he's he's at his best when he's he's making people communicate. Massive psychological thing, but he's also a massive fan of music, and he's a team builder. Anybody that has worked with him will realise that he puts the team around him that he knows is going to do the correct job. So he wouldn't put a particular style of engineer on a Dixie Chicks record. You know, it's, it's all about going, well, that guy's doing a great job. I remember Tony asking him if I... If, because I, I worked on that album from pre writing sessions you know it was like tony and i have a relationship where we we will work songs up i'll program drums during demo phases i play bass on them it gets to the point where then whoever we're working with the band will come in and things will get handed off but the core of it is these ideas that get formulated by tony and we put together so i was involved in that particular project from pre ozzy ever hearing it because there were songs that were already in that genesis. Um, by the time it gets to the actual recording, I think something like 18, 20 months had passed due to various things. Um, and I remember Tony having the conversation with Rick saying, you know, is Mike going to be involved? Because we're all out in LA and will he have a part in the actual recording? And he was just like, yes, he is absolutely. He's he's part of the project. He's important for you guys. He's important as a go-between. I'm going to have Greg Fiddleman as my lead engineer because he knows the room, he knows me, and equally you need Mike. And that was a very, a f not flattering, but um, a nice thing to hear because it's like he recognised that there was more to what I'd done. I wasn't just this guy that did the demos and, hey, now it's time to do the real thing. He and I would have constant conversations throughout the tracking phases about reading body language, dealing with Tony, dealing with the various English things that were being said. Um, conversations about the feel of the track as well. It'd be like, did that feel slow to you, Mike? And it's like, it didn't it didn't time slow but it definitely felt like it was an energy thing so this this stuff that i learned off him was um <laughs> without getting to doctor who that time was very very um malleable because you know i'd be there tapping tempo that nothing was done to click so i'd be kind of tapping tempo on every take every part of every take i'd go you know verse one that it would be like 93 and then it would go up a bit higher and then all this stuff, and we'd go through, and he'd be like, this one sounds better. What is it? And it's because they'd locked in better, but it might have been slower, but it felt quicker. And there was this whole thing about don't be fooled by what the tempo says. Don't be fooled by having it having to be on grids. This was about what is the en what energy of the track make you feel like. And 
it's really it, it's so important because that that thing I said about the the technology and computers and how wonderful computers are. If you're not looking at a screen, if you can get back to listening, it's a it's a whole different ball game. It's what we what we actually want to um, what's what we respond to emotionally, you know, and and you can't program that. Yeah, absolutely, and I think. You know, a lot of those bands that Rick tends to work with, they they do tend to come from that analog era, you know, or, or, or some of the earliest records were at least. And I think that there is that magic because you're right, like they're not bound to the constrictions of like working in digital and having a click track and seeing the visual thing. So, you know, it, it's really interesting to hear his approach. So so it sounds like he, you know, he's he's the kind of guy who's just like all about the personality, creating the, creating the atmosphere and getting the vibe right for the tracks. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and the thing is what's, what's interesting is that even all that being said, he works with hip hop guys and he created that whole thing of the, you know, the New York hip hop stuff with beastie boys, all of those things put run DMC and Aerosmith together. And it's that, that couldn't be more gridded and te- technology led but he's still able to take those things and go this is what this needs and i mean that was that was an incredible thing i've told the story god don't know how many times but just sitting having lunch outside the studio chatting with tony rick came over and he said uh, tony said to him how did you find brad you know brad wilk who played on 13 oh i've worked with him on a couple of albums and he said, um, he said it was quite, it was quite funny. He said, you know, he, he said I, um, I did an, uh, an audio slave album. And Tony went, oh yeah. He goes, oh, I'd forgotten about that. Um, and he said, yeah. He says, I, I just, I knew that, um, I knew that Chris Cornell was looking for a change. He said, and I knew that Zach didn't want to do any more rage stuff. He says, so I just kind of thought, well, oh, they need a singer and he needs a band, and that's audio slave. And you know, for him to do that would have been incredible. For him to put Run DMC and Aerosmith together and effectively give Aerosmith the second life that they got, that's genius. It's not just dumb luck. That's a guy who knows music and goes, we're ready for this. This will really work. And he's not frightened to put put that stuff forward. So um, it's really interesting the way his, his mind works. I don't think you can get into his mind. I don't think you'd want to. But he's, he's, he definitely, when he hits sit well with people, he does an incredible job. And I'll tell you what, um, I think a lot of people complain about him and, and say very, very nasty things about him, even artists that have worked with him. But you can pretty much guarantee that the album they did with him was a, a milestone in their career, if not the biggest selling. You know, I know Slipknot had an issue, but... Man, it was a great album, one of their best selling, you know. So I don't know if Death Magnetic was particularly a deliberate, but that was a pretty big talking point, wasn't it? But <laughs> with, yeah, I mean, um, I mean with, he works Metallica. on records. He works on records that have something to talk about and that there's there's a magic to them. So, you know, it, it's it's very interesting to to learn what goes into it and certainly he seems like the kind of guy who is like that like you said, he's like that team team guy. He puts the team together. He he creates that vibe. He's all about like creating that atmosphere and getting people in a certain headspace to to be themselves and be creative and, and get their emotions out. Um, I'm curious to know, like you you had mentioned that you had worked with Tony Iommi uh, before even getting into the studio on that record, and you were helping him with stuff. So what's that process look like? Like when you're when you're working with him and coming up with these ideas, like how are when you're in that like kind of I guess pre-production stage i guess you can call it are you involved in that as like more of a producer role or are you doing like an engineering side of, like are you helping with some of the arrangement and songwriting What's that i like? um i i just i go about it as i'm i'm his right hand man i enable him i enable him to um to get the ideas that he's he'll, he'll go to bed each night he'll go to bed with an acoustic guitar um, and just for five minutes, he'll stick his phone next to him and he'll record some out, outpourings. He'll just come up with stuff. And then we'll listen through them. And he knows when it's a good one or it's not good, but he, he just knows he's done the brain dump. He's like manifested all these things. And then I might just say, oh, I really like the sound of that. And he'll go, oh, yeah, that's not a bad one. And we'll just start building it. 
and that will so he'll he'll play that properly on a guitar through an amp to a click track amazingly because that's the only thing we can do and then we'll build that into something that is presentable so um for example like because I've, I've been doing this with him since probably about 2006 um i've known him for 10 years more than that we worked together but during 2006 we started prepping stuff um for the collaboration with ronnie james dio so there was a there was a definite need to get some songwriting done so i help him through the process now because i can play keyboards and i can play bass and i can program drums that becomes a whole thing of he can then become more in, involved in the songwriting and arranging and i help him with that um but it's very much everything comes from him and they're never finished until they're given to another artist to collaborate so whether that's a singer or um, a band or whatever anything that we've ever done has always ended up becoming part of a project and then it takes the turn that it needs to and in some instances i've produced others i've co-produced sometimes i've just been an engineer but it's um yeah it's and again it's that thing of of being able to to know your know your role in the project and not feel well shit i produced the last thing it's like oh okay that's not me this time it's it's the humility thing that's why I particularly as i say i love the marco selli comment about it you know for sure do you feel You're that- not always top dog yep do you feel like working with an artist like that who has such a prolific past and history of, you know, writing certain songs that sound a certain way, do you feel like there's kind of like a an expectation of so, of sorts to reproduce that magic on a regular basis or is it or, or when you're working on these ideas is it just like anything goes we're just going to make whatever we like? I think um you only have a right for yourself. Anybody that tries to second guess the public is on a downward spiral into nowhere because you you know when you when you first get your 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 first success the first time you find an audience they they find you and they love you unconditionally that's the only time you get an honest response in your career so after that you end up um evolving you got to stop yourself from listening to the critics and um and worrying about fan backlash because everybody's got an opinion and if you go if you go down the route of trying to please these people on the left and they still don't like it you're an asshole if you and the people on the right don't like it so you're still an asshole if you please the people on the right they may like it the ones on the left don't like it and so whatever happens you're an asshole unless everybody loves it and that doesn't generally happen does it Unless it's ACDC when they came back after 10 years, in which case everybody loves it. Except they probably got the haters as well. So the thing you've got to do is you've got to be authentic and just be what you are. Fuck the haters. Don't worry about um, pleasing anybody but the group of people that are involved in the project. And that's that's what I've learnt more and more over the last few years. Um, I've seen... I was lucky enough to be involved in that process from the early days of 2006 when Tony and Dio got back together. Now that was like, that's one of those golden eras for me. It was only a couple of years, but we did magic during that, that time. And to be a friend of Ronnie's and be involved in that process and watching him and Tony besting each other, not through any sort of like, I'm going to do better than you, but the encouragement they were giving each other, the the challenge of we can make this better. If I do that, will you do that? And watching that rub off on Vinny the drummer and Giza being involved in it all as well and just being a part of that. And I'm the central hub of that because I'm trying to get all these ideas captured and make sure we don't lose anything. That makes you step your game right up there and... One of those things that you you get to realise is that um, in certain instances that whatever you do in your life, you've got to do it to that level because when I'm working on something with any of these guys, 
there's a pretty good chance that someone on every corner of this planet is going to hear it. So I better not be lazy and fuck up at a crossfade or, or punch the wrong thing in, you know, or, or leave anything undone that, that I wished I'd done. You can't be lazy. You've got to just up your game and go, I'm in this to, to just do the best I can possibly do because everybody is putting their all into this. It's never abandoned. It's all just like, let's just make this as good as possible. And, and it's, it's a great, it's a great thing because then I see people that get pissed off about the most ridiculous things. Um, and it's like, man, you're in, you're in the best business in the world. You know, you, you, you're here hearing shit for the first time. It's like, I love it when friends of mine in the movie industry, oh, I can't tell you what I'm working on, but it's really cool. And you're like, oh, you know, I know what you're working on, but please tell me about it. But nobody can. The excitement's palpable. And it's the same thing. You sit there and you go, I cannot wait for this to be unleashed on the world. And then you get the haters and you just think, oh, fuck them. <laughs> we liked it. Yeah. No, I love that. And I think it's it's awesome to hear that, you know, even after so many years of doing this, th these guys are still encouraging themselves to to be better and do better. And I think that that's something that's something that really says a lot about the longevity of these people's careers, because so many artists are just like they're just in their head about things and they just do it their own way. They, a lot of people don't want any input. A lot of people just think like whatever pours out of me, that's what you're going to get. But like to hear people who have been in this industry for a long time being like, we can do better. We can push each other. We can rewrite things like, you know, revamp this however we need to, to just make the best version of these songs. It really does says, say a lot about why these people have had such long, lucrative careers. Yeah. Yeah. And you get you get people, um, they are icons. You know, you've got someone like Tony and someone like Ronnie. They come along once in a, so it's not even a generation, is it? They, they, are, they are the originals that people aspire to be. So there's a reason that, that when they came together, the work was just incredible. Now, it didn't please a lot of people, but it was also, in the first instance, a, a new phase in Sabbath's life. And then when they got back together again for the third time, I think it was, um, 2006, it was one of the most anticipated things I'd ever worked on. It was like, shit, you're doing the, the thing with Dio. It's like, yeah, I know. You know, you, you pinch yourself. And it's, it's, you get dragged into this whole thing of how incredible it is because... These are, these are the people that everybody wants to be. You know, not one person I've ever spoken to that I, I it's sort of a, a shrouded thing, but yeah, that I really give a shit what they think. Most people would would rate these people as being the best, you know, and there's there's very few of them. There are the iconic bands that, that led this and everybody's like a generation later. You know, and they they're all doing great work, but they all cite these people as the um as the people that got them into it. And I'm just really lucky because, you know, I've I've managed to sustain, you know, twenty six, twenty seven years with Tony. That's amazing. Yeah, you're in such a cool position. You you've heard you've heard songs that have never seen the light of day and heard heard all the alternate versions of everything. Like how cool is that? That that's something That's I'm, great. Yeah. A lot of people don't get that experience, so that's very very cool. Yeah, I'd love to shift gears and and uh, talk a little bit more about some of your engineering and um, and one of the things that I so I, I happened to find this video of you a while ago and you were uh, uh -oh. setting up some <laughs> it, was, it was a good video <laughs> okay but uh, no you you were setting up some drums for recording and uh, one of the things that caught my attention in that video was that when it came to miking toms I noticed that you liked to mic toms on the top and bottom and. And I was curious, like that's that's something I don't see done very often. And I, I know I know a handful of people that do it, but but I'm curious to know why you like making toms that way, and uh, you know what what would you say the advantages are with that? Um, it's actually it's quite funny because I've, I've done another thing recently, um, which yeah, I think it came out about a month ago. I should send you the link to it where I go deep into it. But the um, the reason for making top and bottom is. The main one is that there is so much tone that comes from the bottom skin that you miss if you don't mic the bottom skin up. Um, the 
the reason a lot of people don't do it is because they're lazy. <laughs> Again, um, one of the side effects of miking top and bottom is that you get a rejection of the spill because the top mic is out, out of phase or polarity reverse the bottom mic. So consequently, when you polarity reverse the bottom mic, it's picking up the spill the same in the room, but that's out of phase at certain frequencies. So you get a reduction in, in the spill. So that's a great byproduct of it. Um, I started to do it because a friend of mine, he was working with Chris Sheldon, who's another friend of mine, great engineer. He's done like Foo Fighters. So he, he mixed the color and the shape. Absolutely brilliant guy. Um, he's, he's an awesome guy and very humble too. Um, and he doesn't, he, he denies this, but he says he likes to do top and bottom miking as well, but he denies the Y lead thing that I do. And all that happened was I did, um, I was doing some gorilla recordings with early Octopres and I didn't have that many channels. And a friend of mine said, oh, Sheldon said you can do it with a Y lead. And I went, oh, okay. And being you know, able to make my own cables. I made up some, some Y leads and all they are is two female XLRs um, connected to a male XLR and the one of the female XLRs is polarity reversed. So you're doing the polarity reverse in the cable. I use clip-on mics because I don't like too many stands around and drummers are always moving their drums around. So just stick the mics on the drums and they, they travel with them. Um, so I, I was able to, I was able to get like kick, snare, three or four toms, pair of overheads into an eight channel interface. And then I discovered this byproduct of the, the phase reverse thing. So I was working in like rehearsal rooms and doing these guerrilla recordings and my toms were punching. And I was, I found that. Um, just using the cheap 604 Sennheisers were every bit as good as any other mic I've tried on toms, within reason. Um, you need to EQ tom mics. There's no getting away from it unless you're doing jazz or you've got, what's his name, Ross Garfield, doing your drum tuning for you. And he's brilliant. He did some stuff on Sabbath, but he is bloody expensive <laughs> and you can't afford to have Ross on the project. So... Um, so these things need EQing. And um, my thing, <laughs> I'm, I'm a real twat, as people will attest to. I like to dispel myths. And I always make a joke about the 421 being the most, the most brilliant, the best Tom mic in the world. Because everybody's like, oh, it's got to be a 421. The thing is fucking 14 inches long when it's got an XLR on it. It's ridiculous. You try sticking that under one of Nico McBrain's Tom's. Right, or onto it. You can't. He's got fucking symbols overhanging the lip. You cannot get these things near the drums. I did a thing recently where I, um, I did I did a complete breakdown over a two day period of of getting drum sounds, and it sounds boring, but it's mostly talking and listening and trying stuff. But part of it was we took. 421 and a 604, and we put them next to each other on the top skin. And I said, let's go between the two. And there was no no tomfoolery or anything. We listened to both mics, and everybody in the room went, oh, we don't give a shit. They both sound similar. I went, okay, good. So which one do you want to use? Well, the 421, because it's better. Well, it's not, clearly. We've just heard that it's really similar. I said, okay. Let's now mic up the bottom and see what that does. And it's the same deal, you know, similar sound. But what people heard was how much tone comes from the bottom. So it's mostly stick attack and a little bit of something from the top skin, but most of the tone comes from the bottom head. So I said, let's put those together. Now, you can't clip to 421s on a drum because the, you can't get a clip. That, well, with a 421, you can't get the fucker to stay on a mic clip anyway because it's got that stupid design. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> most 421s have got duct tape wrapped around them for good reason. But anyway, so you've got these you've got these mics top and bottom. Um, and I said, let's compare. Let's just keep being fair and we'll let everybody blind test. And there was never anything in it 
What happened was I then said, okay, let's move this ride symbol over this floor, Tom. And we couldn't get the 421 in. The bottom of the floor, Tom, was too, too close to the floor. You couldn't get a 421 in. I said, okay, so that being said, the greatest Tom Mike in the world can't get anywhere near the Tom. If I have to change the angle of it, I'm changing what I need sonically. So why don't we play with these awful live mics that I brought and stick a Y lead on them, see what they sound like. And all we needed to do was find the resonance that was building up and cut it in the low mids. We compared that to the greatest Tom mic in the world, and it was night and day. Because by dispelling the myth and dumping everything that we had thought about as being correct, we listened and we did the thing that was correct for the job. Now, it's, it's not always 604s. On bigger toms, you, you generally you can put on a, a kick drum mic, so I'll use D6s or SML, Beta 52s or whatever. But the point is, it's about listening. And most of what I try to dispel with people is the idea that there is only one way to do it. And I'll get into trouble, but I don't care. Forums are a nightmare for, for putting myths out and convincing people that there is only one way to do it. And there's, a, there's a, so much sheep mentality that goes on in these forums that people get embarrassed and, and bullied into thinking they have to do something a certain way. And if, if your listeners are, are people that are, are working in their home studios or trying to start a career, don't get swayed by what people say on forums because I guarantee most of these fuckers haven't actually had a career in music yet. They're all copying from someone else and they're just basically the T-birds ganging up on, you know, the underdogs. It's, it's crap. You've got, to, you've got to stand with the courage of your own convictions and go, I like the way that sounds. I don't care if it's a $50, you know, mic I picked up at the local flea market. If that sounds good, and I and I compared it to records, and that's the sound I want to go for. Then it's the right mic for the job. So true. It, it's funny. Like I went through a similar experiment not too long ago for one of my membership sites, where we it was just like a big mic shootout series, basically, and we we use same thing on all the toms and snare and overheads. Like we use everything from fifty sevens to U eighty sevens and whatever, right? So so like quite a wide range of pricing. And it was amazing to hear at the end of the day, like how little difference it made for, for so many things. And sometimes there was an obvious difference, but then, but for like close miking most of the time, it was like, meh, this is pretty negligible, you know, like the, this little sub hundred dollar mic worked better than this $3,000 mic or pretty close to it, you know? So yeah, it was pretty and, amazing. And most, most of it comes from the fact that you, if again, back to laziness, get in the room and move it, hear what that does, move it again. Does that change it? Because it's a hell of a lot more can be done by mic positioning than expensive preamps and converters and changing the mic. I mean, changing the mic works, obviously. But the point is, if you've got something, you can totally change the sound. That That's something, um, again, that is a really, really easy thing. You don't have to buy a Dynamount to, you know, the robot mic machine to to find out where's good on a, on a, um, on a guitar cab. Get a piece of um, console tape, put it, across the front of the cab and mark out a load of numbers like one through 10 and record the same signal on each of those numbers to different tracks and go through them and listen to how the sound changes and make your decision based on where the mic sounded good because it happens with absolutely everything there's you know that's not even getting into proximity effect on a cab there's loads and loads of things you can do it's great if you can get someone in the other room just to sweep the mic across something or to just you know I do it with kick drums a lot, you know, I get get someone to just go and uh, I'll point at them and I'll just go, keep moving it out. And they, they move the kick drum mic out until I hear it sounds really, really sweet. And it's like, okay, lock it off there. And then I'll put another mic in there and I'll do the same with those two. And then I'll use a device to actually make sure they're in phase. So I use a radial phaser to get them in phase because the two positions sound fucking fantastic, but they may not necessarily be in phase with each other. So then you you move them using an analog phase device. I love that. And then commit. I, I think that's a great tip, especially like, you know, just marking off. I love what you suggested about the cabinet and marking off with the tape. I, I think it's something that so many people don't do because they just read this is the one way to do it. So that's all they do. And, and it's like, well, 
you don't need to like constantly change out mics. You don't need to like constantly change out the amps or whatever. Sometimes it's just like a slight movement, even an inch will will give you that sound that you're looking for. So it's these little details that are so important. Um, so yeah, that that was a great tip. I I appreciate that. Um, one other thing I wanted to ask you about is that. I know at the very beginning of this, you said you kind of have this reputation for working with metal and you, and you don't really, you know, <laughs> you don't really want to be known as that metal guy, <laughs> but, but I mean, the truth is you have worked with a lot of yeah. great metal and, um, and one thing that I know is very common in a lot of metal music is like the constant barrage of like double kicks, you know? And I know that with that, it can, double kicks can definitely clutter up a mix very easily. And especially when you're trying to find that balance of kick drum versus bass guitar, you know, finding that low end balance. Do you have any tips for cleaning up your mixes so that those two tracks work well together, the kick and bass? Um, yeah, I mean, the the initial thing is um, this will always come back to automation um, because I think um, I think Barisi's the guy, isn't it, Joe, who um, who said um, the, the main things when you start a mix are, are level panning and phase. So we've got the phase thing out of the way, hopefully, with tracking. Um, the rest of it is is making things work in the um, in the levels dimension. Frequency is important as well. I mean, there's I, I think there's like five dimensions of mixing, which is like um, height, which is EQ, level, which is um, the size of the object in the mix. Um, panning is obvious. Um, depth is the other thing that's that's number four so you can put stuff behind and then the fifth fifth dimension is time again doctor who but it's like if two things don't exist at the same time they can't get in each other's way so there's all these things that you can make room for in a, in a mix um i like to look at um look at finding space in a mix by not imagining the mix as a picture but as a massive fish tank that gives you your three dimensions. And now if you look at that, the front plane of the fish tank is your speakers. Behind that is another whole three-dimensional thing where you've got the the four dimensions plus the time thing. Um, and um, so so it's important to automate. It's, it's important that if something is in the way of something else, if you can move it out of the way, even just temporarily, you perform a sleight of hand thing, that's great. So with with kick drums, double kicks working with bass, it may not be double kick the entire way through. So if you've got a problem fitting the double kicks and the bass in, in the same zone during a particular section, you've got a load of options. You can take the leading kick, um, which can be maybe his right foot. Um, it's a lot easier when they've been recorded on separate tracks, but if they're using a double kick pedal, it's just a bit more hard work. So you actually have to create a second track and that can be a hell of a lot of edits, but Hey, tap to transient when Avid haven't broken it. Um, you know, tap to transient, use split silence, whatever, split the tracks, keep the depth of the low end on your leading kick and EQ out the bottom end on the second kick. Let the first kick have the depth. The second kick is just providing you with the impact that will give you room for the bass. If the bass needs to shift up, EQ that for that section. We're in a time where everything is automatable. So if something is wrong, you can fix it. So try these things, see what works. I'm not a huge fan of the idea of moving the bass out of the way by side chaining a compressor with the kick drum. However, I think that could be applicable if you use a multi-band compressor and you just move the bottom end out of the way. So you just side side chain the bottom end of the multi-band and move the low end of the bass out of the way of the kick. Um, I think in this kind of music, the kicks are going to lead it. Therefore, the there is no fight. The bass has to give way. But there's nothing to say the upper harmonics of the bass. Um, and I'm only talking about above the 50 hertz fundamental of a kick drum. You know, move moves the stuff above. Generally, arrangement will also take care of it as well. Um so in pre-production in the writing make sure those those things aren't a problem together you can you know double massive double kick section maybe the bass players can just shift it up a little bit um go to a different pickup just change the tonality a little bit um you've also got to compete with the guitars but their low ends normally coming from left and right so you can move the bass out 
I mean, God, everybody hates chorus, but stick a little bit of symphonic on the bass, shift it outwards a bit. There's lots of things you can do. It's just about if something's in the way of something else, find out in which of those five dimensions you can get rid of it. I love and, it. Yeah. That, that's great. That's a great tip. And I think you're absolutely right. Like, I think a lot of people forget that we can automate low end with EQs and whatnot in, in our plugins because the technology is there. You know, it's not like in the analog day where you had to have someone who was just manning that 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 band and like, OK, the time, time's coming up. Like, let's roll this off, you know. So, everything- well, you know, you know, the story about Mike Shipley, you know, who passed away a few years ago, Mutt Lang's guy. He used to sit there with a 31 band graphic EQ during the mix and he would do EQ changes as they were printing the mix on the lead vocal because Mutt heard certain resonances on certain vocals, that certain syllables, certain words, and Mike would have a list of things and he would literally be pulling out frequencies as they printed. That's hard work. You know, that's, that's the thing. It's, it, don't leave any stone unturned. That, that's choreography. Like, mm, you know? <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Well, Mike, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, so we should probably start to wrap things up here a bit. But if people want to uh, learn more about you and the work that you're doing, what's the best way for them to follow you online? Um, my website is mikeexeter.com. Um, that's got the links to the socials. Um, I, they don't get updated very often <laughs> because I'm a bit busy. Um, but Facebook, Mike Exeter. Um, and I do, I do videos for a friend of mine um, uh, on this site called recordproduction.com. And that, that was one of the ones I was alluding to recently. That's, that's quite a good resource. It's a YouTube resource. It's been going for over 20 years and it's, it's probably one of the longest running historical, um, uh, research bases. You know, he's got interviews with many, many people. Uh, he's, he's basically the head of sales for SSL over here. Um, so he's had access to studios, producers and engineers. And he's got some incredible interviews over the years. But from time to time, we'll do um, videos about certain techniques. Um, there's one of me doing a, a proper tape flange from a few years ago, you know, just making that work. There's all these things that, that are cool, but that's a great resource um, to look at. But yeah, I'm just just, just online, usually ranting about something. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> cool. And then lastly, are there any cool projects that you're currently working on right now that you might be able to talk about? Yeah, there's there's a couple in the pipeline that I can't mention, um, but they're quite exciting. That um, that um, hopefully we'll see the light of day soon. I uh, I finished a couple of years ago, but that's waiting to come out. I had a chance with Tony to remix the 1994 Black Sabbath album, Forbidden, um, which which was the final album before they reunited in 98 99. Um, so that will be coming out. Um, there's there's a reason for the delay. It's because they're kind of doing reissues of the Ronnie stuff now, and then they're moving through the Tony Martin era. And this was that final album, but this was a ground up remix, and um, and I got to work um, work with Cozy Powell's drums, which was just like that's a masterclass in cymbal work. Um, that's cool. And that was all track to tape, and some of it wasn't tracked amazingly well. And he had something like four or five toms and they were recorded to a stereo pair. So making those toms punch was an engineering feat. Um, but it's, it's, that was cool. Um, I'm working with some really, really cool, um, younger bands. Um, there's a band, for, in fact, Rob Halford, um, likes these guys there because they're from his hometown, the band called Wolfjaw, who, uh, from Walsall in England. And they are, they're so authentic. They're a three piece. They're, they could never record with a click. They did. The first two albums just didn't do them justice, but we're, we're working together now. And they just walked into the studio. I couldn't believe it could be done. And it's just fantastic, heavy, bluesy rock. Um, and yeah, just a few things like that. Um, and yeah, hopefully more to go. I'm, I'm going to be working with a, um, Croatian Colombian band in a couple of weeks. They're coming over f- um, to do an album. They're called The Reaction, um, and uh, they're sort of um, not geopolitical. That's probably the wrong word, but they kind of remind me of Rage. Um, you know, they're like gro- groovy, heavy, and they want to do good by the world. You know, they they give a shit about the planet. So that'll be interesting. So yeah, there's a bit of um, international stuff going on. 
Sweet. Can't wait to check those out. They sound awesome. All right, Mike. Well, well, thank you again for taking the time to do this. I had a lot of fun. Total this pleasure. is uh, really, really informative. Thank you. So that was my interview with Mike Exeter, and what a cool story. I love the fact that he really diversified his skills, and it's funny to hear how he went into it with one vision of what his career was going to look like, and that just evolved into so many different things, and all of those skills just came together at the right moment and made him the perfect fit for working with bands like Black Sabbath and so many others. So it really says a lot about the idea of just really making sure that you're prepared and that you've branched out and tried lots of different things so that you have the skill sets to to find those opportunities and to just really make the best out of them. So that was a really cool story. And I also loved the detail that he went into when he was talking about miking drums and positioning your microphones when you're miking guitar amps. He shared some really great tips there. I love his tip about putting tape on your guitar cabinet and trying things out at different distances from the center of the cone and all that stuff. This is a great way to learn how to position your microphones and how to get different sounds depending on the mic positions. That's actually one of the things that inside of the Mastery Mix Academy, which is my monthly membership, we go into a lot of detail with that and we talk about the different mic positions and what to expect as you move things around whenever you're miking an instrument. So um, it was very cool to hear Mike's approach to that. And uh, definitely I, it's something that I highly recommend you all try out. So yeah, I hope that you enjoyed that episode. And as always, if you did enjoy that, please make sure to subscribe to this podcast so that you can be notified as new episodes go live. And last but not least, if you haven't already yet, make sure to visit MasterYourMix.com. And on the website, I've got tons of great resources to help you make your mixes sound incredible. And one of the big resources that you're definitely going to want to check out is called The Mixing Mindset. That is a book that I put out a few years ago, all about providing you with a step-by-step formula for creating pro mixes from your home studio. And inside, we go into all of the various steps of the mixing process, what to listen for, what kind of processing you should be adding, uh, you know, which when to use effects, all that kind of stuff. The idea is to make it very clear for what you should do when it comes to mixing so that you're not feeling scatterbrained throughout the entire process. Instead, you have a very clear vision and a very clear process to follow. And when you do that, you will get awesome results. So definitely make sure to check that out. It's called The Mixing Mindset, and it's available at MasterYourMix.com. All right, guys, that is it for today's episode. I really hope you enjoyed that, and I'm looking forward to chatting with you in the next one. We'll talk soon. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to the Master Your Mix podcast. To have your questions answered, submit your questions to questions at masteryourmix.com. Please go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And for more information on how you can improve your mixes, visit masteryourmix.com.